Okay, we're going to finish up chapter 25 in the book of Matthew. There's only 28 chapters, so we're getting close to the end of this book. Chapter 25, verse 31. The sheep and the goats. You see, all of 25 has the same meaning. The ten virgins, you know, they didn't have enough spiritual oil with them. The parable of the gold bags. They misused, the one man misused what God gave him. And the sheep and the goats. Now, this is very profound. It talks about who's going to heaven and who is going to hell. Now, I read the Bible literally. What it says, that's what I read. What it says, that's what I study. I did not personally write the Bible. I was not here when um, Jesus was on the cross, but I'm still a believer. And I read the words in the Bible, what they tell me they're saying. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, I'm assuming that's every person that was ever born. I assume this is judgment day. I, I might be jumping ahead here. You know, they asked Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? Hey, hey, man, who gave you the right to do this to us? That's when you find out Jesus, excuse me, that's when you find out Jesus has full authority over all things, heaven and earth. Jesus has full authority over heaven and earth, angels and mankind. Everything, and even fallen angels. Everything. That's what gives him the authority to sit up there on his glorious throne and start separating sheep from goats. I mean, if you're going to be one of the sheep and go to heaven, this is a glorious day. If you're one of the goats and you're about to go to hell, but you don't know it, this is an annoying thing that is happening. This Jesus that claims to have all power and authority that you, a non-believer, never followed. I don't mean you personally, I mean just non-believers in general. That you out there who are non-believers, you never follow Jesus, and now he's telling you what to do, and there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing you will be able to do. You will not be able to stop him. Believe me, the devil tried. The devil is a thousand times more powerful than you or I. And the devil couldn't stop him. The devil couldn't overthrow God. The devil couldn't stop the cross. The devil couldn't stop the rapture. The devil cannot stop judgment day. So how do you think you're going to stop it? This is where you find out you've been living on the wrong side of the tracks, my friend. And you, you, every single fiber in your spirit is going to say, I should have followed Jesus because I sure, I sure don't want to spend eternity in hell. But it will be too late, as we read here. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. What that's talking about is believers on his right, non-believers on his left. 
Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, this is the sheep. Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes or clothe you and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king, Jesus, will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. This is um, a great picture of dear believers do not give up hope. Do not think that when you do a small gesture that it doesn't count. Jesus said, even if you give someone a, a thirsty man a drink of water, if you give your enemy a drink of water, you will be blessed from doing that for all eternity. Now listen to where we are going, the believers. Come! You who are blessed by my Father, and take your inheritance. Did you know that you have a um, unlimited, unlimited, can't even be counted? Your inheritance is so large; it's all eternity, it's heaven, earth, the kingdom going in and out of the city, everything. You are inheriting everything. The least in the kingdom of God will be the, considered the greatest. So for you following Jesus here during your days on earth, you see a homeless man, you give him a couple dollars, you just got blessed by you know, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. That is never going to be taken away from you as a believer. None of this stuff will help you if you are first not a believer. You have to first be a believer. Or everything you do will not count. And we will see that here in a minute. See, we believers, we're not supposed to get easily angry like the non-believers do. We are not supposed to be getting, we believers are not supposed to be getting drunk and high and looking at pornography like the non-believers do. We believers are supposed to be living completely different lives than the rest of the world for Jesus. And at the end, the judgment day, Jesus will look over at the believers on his right, the sheep, the believers, and say, Come, enjoy your inheritance. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Oh, it is going to be fascinating for all eternity living there with Jesus. Wow. What does he say to the, the um, goats now? The non-believers. The goats. Those who, the weeds. The chafe. Those who refuse. 
They've been alive 80 years just like you, and they refused every single day Jesus Christ's offer. They refused the offer, God's offer of his son, Jesus Christ. They refused, refused, refused. When they hear Christmas music, it makes them sick to their stomach. When they hear songs about of praise and worship about Jesus, it makes them sick. Drives them completely insane, like throwing salt in salt water in their eyes. Then he will say to those on his left, verse 41, depart from me. Wow, he gets right into it. Just like he said in another verse, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Look at how he just looks at those on his left and says, depart from me. Now look what he says to those on his right, us. Come, you who are blessed by my father. He holds out his hands. He says, come, you who are blessed by my father, come to me, receive, enjoy, worship, love, friendship, riches, glorifying God for all eternity. Come and enjoy everything that has been prepared for you since the beginning of the creation of the world because you believed. You believed. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed. Wow. There could not be a more stark, complete difference in the entire Bible. This is the greatest example in the entire Bible about two groups of people Everybody's worried about chapter 24, when will the end come? They should be worried about chapter 25, the sheep and the goats, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? This is the um, verses that you should be worried the most about on this earth. He tells the one group, come, you who are blessed by my Father and enjoy everything. He tells this other group, the non-believers, remember now, you got to remember, God's not doing this. They did it to themselves. God gave every single person a, an offer of his son their entire lives. They rejected that offer. Then he will say, then he, Jesus, will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The non-believers will be ushered away by the angels to eternal punishment. <whistles> Thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Thrown into hell, thrown into the lake of fire. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's going to suck there and you can never get out. It's eternal. You're in constant torment and pain. Now, why do we get credit for doing some things? Because we are believers. The very first step is becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. And when he comes into your life, then... 
you start living for him and looking for opportunities to serve Jesus. That's when you start looking for opportunities to serve Jesus Christ. Now, I'm just speaking in general terms here. The believers were looking for opportunities along their lifetime to serve Christ. Oh, it could be the 1800s. And maybe a believer went down to the local church at Christmas, you know, and gave everybody a candy cane in the name of Jesus. Maybe they they brought the roast down and all the fixings and the pies. Serving, serving, looking for opportunities. Looking for opportunities for someone to say, there's no hope. There's no hope. And you say, as a believer, well, there is hope in Jesus Christ. I can tell you about it if you want me to. Looking for someone in prison who is in prison, but they're getting out, and maybe you took mercy upon them and hired them in the name of Jesus and gave them a job and gave them an opportunity. But the generalized terms are the non-believers live the exact same way just for themselves. That's what it says. They didn't do anything for God, for Jesus. They did nothing. That's why he said in another um, gospel, it says, they will claim that they did all these things in his name and perform miracles in his name. And he says, I will look at them plainly and say, I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. Just like he's saying here, he gets right into it. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed. And throws them into the eternal fire. Wow. It's incredible. Why? Even if they did do works, the works are had no foundation. Their earthly works had no foundation in Christ. Think of it like this. You're building a house, right? You are building a house, but Jesus Christ is the foundation. And every time you do a good work, this is after you've been saved. You have to be saved first or it's not going to matter what you do. They'd be like showing up at a restaurant, painting the outside of the building, painting the inside of the restaurant, cleaning everything, and the owner comes in and says, who are you? Oh, well, I did all these good things to the restaurant. And they say, you don't, you're not even an employee here. You don't work here. We didn't want you to do the. What are you doing? You have to first be an employee to get paid. And I bet you the owner of that restaurant's going to say, not only am I not going to pay you, I'm going to sue you for painting the building the wrong color or something. You have to take the first step of getting a job there, just like Jesus. When it comes to good works, you have to take the first step of following Jesus. Believe upon my son, Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. If you don't take that first step, it doesn't matter what you do after that. You're not going to get paid. Jesus will not pay you. He, you will not pass go. You will not collect $200. You will not go to heaven. It doesn't matter. Without Jesus, you're not going to heaven. Why? So we go all the way back to the beginning, the first offer. Who is making you the offer? I've explained this in on these studies before. It's not Jesus that's making you the offer. I mean, technically, you could make the case is. It's God the Father offering you a way of salvation. Most people think Jesus is doing this. God is offering, 
Jesus said very clearly, with man, this is impossible, but with God, my Father, all things are possible. The offer comes from God. It doesn't come from Jesus. Most people really don't understand that technically. Technically speaking, God is offering you his son. God's not crucifying his son because his son sinned, had sinned. Jesus was without sin. God is not crucifying his son, sacrificing his son, because God needs to be forgiven. No, God is perfect. God is not sacrificing his son for not one of the angels. Angels cannot receive salvation because you're either the two-thirds of the angels that stayed with God and they are still perfect and holy like God, or you're the one-third that fell and God is not offering that one-third salvation. No. They came against God. They tried to kill God. They were going to battle. I mean, which is, it's not possible to do that. But the offer of salvation is for man and woman and children only. But who is making the offer? God, the Father. This is my son. Who is saying that? Who would say this is my son? A father. If you have a son or a daughter, you would say, this is my son, Billy, you know. He's a spoiled little brat. <laughs> but God said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. I'm pleased. This is my son whom I love. This is my son. With him I am pleased. Now, what does God say? Believe upon him and you shall be saved. The Bible does not say, hi, my name is God. If you believe upon me, the Father, you will be saved. You can't do that because God is so holy and perfect, your sin cannot directly go to his presence, be in his presence, no. Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, now, you would have to have that blood sprinkled on you. No, God made a way. And, and technically, once you believe, the blood is spiritually sprinkled upon you. I mean, Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. You can't get a hold of his blood and sprinkle it on people. It doesn't matter. That's not the offer. God never said, sprinkle the blood on yourself and then you'll be saved. God never said, once you're baptized, then you're saved. No, baptism is not required. It's probably a good idea to be baptized, but it's not required. Baptism is a public confession of your salvation, but it is a complete separate thing, in my opinion. Now, there are a lot of Baptist churches, because they call themselves Baptists, Southern Baptists. They will teach that if you are not baptized, you can never, ever go to heaven. But that's not what God the Father said. If you go right back to the simplest form of salvation... God said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Believe upon him, stop, and then you will be saved. It can't be taken away. It can't be added to. You will be saved. God did not say, believe upon him and, and be baptized, and then you will be saved. Believe and be baptized, and then you'll be saved, or believe then be baptized, then do all these good works, then work your way to heaven on the point system or the sliding scale system, and then you will be saved. No. Believe upon my son Jesus, then go into the prisons and give out cups of water and you shall be saved. Nope, nope, that's 100% wrong. Anybody who teaches that just is mistaken. Believe 
upon my son Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Okay, the second group here. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing help? Ah, come on, man. Their eyes were closed. I want to say open your eyes. Your eyes do not become open until you believe upon Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. And by reading the word of God like six days a week is probably the minimum standard I would set on people. It's not a requirement, but you aren't going to go anywhere without the word of God. It's like trying to drive a car without gasoline. You say, well, I, I'm a fancy smancy. I got I got an electric car. Okay, it's trying like trying to drive a, your electric car without electricity. I saw something funny on the internet. This young guy, he went to a store where they had like 10 electric chargers. And he parked in one of the spots because it's closest to the store. And the guy gets out and says next to him, hey, you can't park this for electric cars only. He says, my car is part electric. He goes, no, you got a gas car. He says, my car is gas and electric. The guy says, you're not supposed to park there unless you're charging. And the young guy says, my car is electric. I have a battery in my car. And all the electric components and the computer and everything work off that battery source. So my car is technically electric car. And I thought, wow. And the, the kid said he was like a, um, a physicist or something. He said, so technically all of our cars are electric. And <laughs> the old guy yelling at him, he didn't like that. But nobody likes sitting at the electric car charger, you know, especially if you're on vacation and you got you to gotta wait three hours to charge your car again so you can get going. Now, listen. They will answer, Lord, when did we see you? Well, in America, you can't turn on the radio and flip through the channels without running into a Christian station. Praise be to God for that. You cannot drive down the road without seeing crosses in some people's yards. You cannot um, go through Christmas without hearing about Jesus. You cannot drive down the street anywhere in America, any town in America, any rural area in America, and not see a church with a cross on it. So when they make the claim, well, when did we see you? I never saw you asking me for any help. No, their eyes were closed. They wanted their eyes to be closed. You know, there's a saying. Ignorance is bliss. The dumber you are, the the less you know, the less you're going to be required on this earth to perform. Ignorance is bliss. You know, the boss comes along and says, hey, uh, who who knocked over all these pallets? And everybody says, oh, I don't know. I don't know nothing about that. Uh, pallets, that's not my section. I'm over here. I'm just doing my job over here. I didn't. Well, how could you not hear? All these pallets would have crashed to the ground, making a very loud noise. Well, I, I don't know. I didn't hear. I must have been in the restroom. I don't know. <laughs> Ignorance is total bliss. Look at that crow. Had to fly a little higher than the other crow. Look. Now that is how man is. And that is why this story goes the way it goes. I guarantee the, the crow on the bottom is the, the believer, the humble crow, and the other crow that tried to get ahead of him is the crow with the um full of pride and a non-believer trying to get what he wants. And there you go. The, the, the crow who's a goat, a non-believer. 
It's kind of a weird example, but it was right in front of me. I thought I'd bring it up. That crow was being mean to the other crow 